All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take Proverbs chapter 26. We're going to speak about the nature of the fool and the lazy man. We'll just jump right into the first verse, where honor doesn't fit the fool. As snow in summer and rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. So these things are out of place, and in an economy that's based on grain that's grown in the field, those are going to be disasters of bad timing. So snowfall in the summer would signal the times that are out of joint and would be catastrophic to farmers. So honor for the fool is also out of place and it can lead to disaster. And the fool is a stupid person who is worthless and vain, just the kind of person popular culture seems to honor these days. In verse 2, the destiny of a curse without cause. Like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. So Solomon described birds that fly without taking rest on a branch or surface, in the same way that a bird will fly without landing, so a curse that someone makes without proper cause before God will not alight. If someone's going to pronounce a curse, it doesn't have magical properties. There must be a cause before God for it to have any power. And since the Creator and the Lord of history is the source of blessing and cursing through a fellow human being, the proverb is going to infer that the undeserved, unfitting curse is ineffective because the sovereign isn't going to back it up. And so Balaam is the reluctant witness against all superstition, right? How can I curse whom God has not cursed in Numbers chapter 23? All right, verse 3 through 6, dealing with fools. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the fool's back. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And he who sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. So there is an instrument appropriate for these animals, right? Whip for the horse, bridle for the donkey. And there is also an instrument that's fit for the fool, which is a rod for his back. And what they will not learn from the words of wisdom, they have to learn from pain. And so when a fool pours, uh, pours forth his foolishness, it's often right to not answer him. And sometimes contending with a fool just makes one uh, makes you just like him. Other times the right thing is to answer a fool. And sometimes a wise answer to a fool is going to expose his folly, his idiocracy, and prevent him from becoming wise in his own eyes. It puts him in his place. So those who think Proverbs chapter 26 verse 4 contradicts Proverbs 26 verse 5 are unfamiliar with the nature of practical wisdom in life. They are put together to show that human problems are often complicated and can't always be solved by appealing to a single rule. Right? These aren't absolutes. These are general principles. So one should never expect a good result from sending a message by the hand of a fool. It's like harming yourself. Curiously, God chose the foolish things of this world to be his messengers in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But he wants them to be something better than fools in his work. Verse 7 through 12, the nature of the fool. Like the legs of the lame that hang limp is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Like one who binds a stone in a sling is he who gives honor to a fool. Like a thorn that goes into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. The great God who formed everything gives the fool his hire and transgressor his wages. As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. So in the series of the like the statements, Solomon is going to explain the nature of the fool. The fool's possession of wisdom is useless. The fool's receiving of honor is stupid. The fool's attempt to proclaim wisdom is going to bring pain. And so we get absurd illustrations here, but no less absurd um, is one that gives a fool the honor and praise. And so God's guidance and governing over all things extends to the fool and the transgressor. He will make sure they get what is due in both their hire and their wages. And so a fool will not change their ways apart from a dramatic transformation. Just as it is in the dog's nature to return to his own vomit, it's the fool's nature to repeat his mistakes. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 22 used this verse to illustrate the repulsive nature of a sinner returning to their sin. 
And so despite the severe treatment of a fool, Solomon thought of a man even worse, you know, in even worse danger, the proud man, the one that's wise in his own eyes. This is a special type of mistake, one that will never learn the ways of wisdom. Verse 13 through 16, the nature of the lazy man. The lazy man says there's a lion in the road. A fierce lion is in the streets as a door turns on its hinges. So does a lazy man on his bed. The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl. It wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. So basically it's just like other proverbs that we've heard it. The lazy man is going to create an ex- any excuse to avoid work. Uh, a lion in the road was a virtual impossibility in biblical times if you don't get the analogy there. And the lazy man shows creative talent imagining not only a lion but a fierce one and a form of work but it's dedicated to the effort of avoiding work. You probably know people that will work more avoiding work than just actually doing the job. And so the only way a door can turn is on its hinges. And the only turning the lazy man does is on his bed. And so the humor in this verse is based on the analogy with a door. It moves, but it goes nowhere. Likewise, the lazy guy is hinged to his bed. And so the lack of energy and initiative in the lazy man is so profound that he can't or won't properly care for his personal needs. And the lazy man may lack energy and initiative, but he doesn't lack the high opinion of himself. He's going to consider himself smarter than seven men who can answer sensibly. The lazy man has great confidence in his own abilities, but never seems to accomplish much. Verse 17, the wisdom of not interfering in the disputes of others. He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a dog by the ears. So some find it irresistible to get involved in the disputes of other people. Now that argument doesn't really belong to them, but he's going to make it his own. And Jesus knew when not to get involved in another's dispute, like in Luke chapter 12, verse 14. And so it's foolish and dangerous thing to take a dog by the ears. If you do, it's hard to let go without getting bit, and the dog never appreciates it. Not even Samson grabbed the foxes by their ears in Judges chapter 15, verse 4. And there is a world of difference between suffering as a Christian and suffering as a busybody. Even with Christian intentions, many of us are too fond of meddling in other people's affairs. And this proverb stands true 99 times out of 100, where people meddle with domestic uh, arguments or differences between men and their wives. Verse 18 and 19, the danger of the practical joker. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. So Solomon's going to paint the picture of a fierce warrior with many weapons spreading destruction everywhere. And the guy who plays tricks on others, deceiving them, covering it by saying, I was only joking, is a danger to others and a very unwelcome companion. And this is a guy that indulges only the pure love of mischief. And he carries on a scheme of imposition as harmless play and... (laughs) It's best to avoid such people. Verse 20 through 22, the dangerous words of a gossiper. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out, and when there is no tail-bearer, strife ceases. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a tail-bearer are like tasty trifles, and they go down into the inmost body. So just as wood fuels a fire, so the tailbearer or gossip fuels strife. The fire won't continue to burn without the wood, and the strife won't continue when the tailbearer stops their work. James described the power of words to set a destructive fire in James chapter 3 verse 6. And so the tail receiver and the tailbearer are agents of discord, right? This gossiper. And the Proverbs hammers gossip as always being negative. And strife doesn't create itself. It has a maker, and it is gossip, the tale-bearer, and the contentious man. And when this person goes away, then it just magically disappears. And so this proverb, which is repeated from chapter 18, verse 8, explains that gossip and evil reports brought by people that like to spread gossip are almost impossible to resist. And those who should know better find it very difficult to tell the uh, tale-bearer gossiper to stop talking and this inflicts right gossip inflicts massive damage to friendships 
to family, to <clears throat> reputation. And when we receive gossip, they normally have an effect on us. They go down into us and change the way we think and feel about people, even if it isn't true. And God gave a strong word regarding the confirmation of testimony in Deuteronomy chapter 19, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're not to deal with it. And so once we start eating those little tasty trifles of gossip, it's hard to stop. And that's why they're warning us in advance. Verse 23, fair words covering a foul heart. Fervent lips with a wicked heart are like earthenware covered with silver dross. There's people that are able to speak with power and persuasion. They have a wicked heart, and the ill effect of their wicked heart is made much more effective because of their fervent words. So a bad mouth and a worse heart here. Uh, wicked men are said to speak with a heart and a heart, as speaking one thing and thinking another, drawing a fair glove on a foul hand. So this is an example of something that looks superficially good with silver veneer, but it's worthless on the inside. So the man mentioned in the first line may attract people superficially, but inside he's worthless. Verse 24 through 26, the secret hater. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. So it's common for those to hate others, God or men, to disguise it with their words. They don't want to give up their hate, but they don't want it to be known, you know, they don't want to be known as a hater. And so the secret hater deceives others, but he also deceives himself. And he imagines himself to be better than he really is. And so this guy shouldn't be trusted, even if he speaks kindly. They don't respect his true intentions in his heart. And so the seven abominations is an abstraction for the full uh, expression of his wicked thoughts and deeds that utterly offend you know, the moral sensibilities of the righteous. So whether the assembly is in the world or the world to come, the wickedness and evil heart of the secret hater will be revealed. Right? God weighs the hearts. Verse 27 and 28, the self-appointed judgment on the lying tongue. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have it roll back on him. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth works ruin. So in God's judgment, he often appoints people to reap what they sow. And that he's going to treat them the same way they've treated others. They're going to fall down into a pit that they've dug for others, like Haman in the book of Esther. And the stone they rolled against someone will roll back on them. And you can look at Daniel's enemies in Daniel chapter 6. And so a liar does his destruction without sympathy for others. He doesn't feel sorry for the ones he crushes. He actively hates them. And so lying is an act of hatred one way or another. It's going to destroy those who they deceive. So flattery is another way the lying tongue brings ruin. The flattering mouth builds pride and manipulates others for deceptive goals. That'll tie up chapter 26. Next time, we'll obviously take chapter 27. Thank you for joining me.